a lot, a lot of negative what? Just a big medical, not, you know, about doing self surgery, but I think that's just big medical, you know. Oh, I mean, big medical is always going to be big medically, right? I mean, it's like, it's my kidney. Yeah, exactly. I bought the ice. <laughs> it's like, I, uh, you want me to sign something? Fine. You know what? My DNA is all over it. I always get it back. All right, so we're waiting to see who is showing up in the chat. Wouldn't mind anyone blaming us for being flat. I got us a new listener. Uh, my exterminator, cool guy, was like, hey, is Friday a good time to come by? I'm like, oh, well, I'm going to be podcasting. It's like, oh, it's a podcast. <laughs> I'm like, Great, thanks. I'll listen to it on the way over. It It is one of those things that is short. Podcasting is in a weird spot where it's like it simultaneously is respected and derided because it's an easy punching bag, you know? Uh, because everybody wants to be a podcaster, but some of us started 15 years ago. <laughs> uh, yeah. Oh, well, there I we think, are. I think the advantage, though, is that we, 15, brother, a lot longer than that. It's like 19 years ago. Oh, <laughs> I, I, I think that part of the thing, though, is that Somebody coming to it now is going to have look at it a totally different medium. We'll have eyes that, or ears that I just don't have, and that's the thing I appreciate is that somebody's going to go in like, "Oh, you know, you could do this," and be like, 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 you know, somebody just mentioned cereal. That was funny because it was like, you know, we we've been in this for like a decade, and cereal comes out, people are like, "Have you heard of this thing called podcasting?" And it became relevant. That's point it became real. And I know Biocast joking, but like that all of a sudden was. Hey, if you told me you know, months before, what about doing a podcast where you do like crime, follow true crime? I'd be like, well, people could just watch TV for that. That's not going to work. Wah, wah, wah. You know, Andrew misses the boat yet again. Um, and that's that's like, God knows. Like, I, I was like, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to live stream myself playing video games. Who's going to watch that? You know, quote Andrew. Right. <laughs> Turns out lots of people. Well, and, and, and it takes a while. Like, for example, on the whole Twitch phenomenon, I... I was years into the Twitch phenomenon where I was like, why are people watching this? And then I remembered, oh, wait, when I was a kid, I was playing video games on a couch, but only one person had the controls at any given time, and the rest of us would just watch them play and cheer for them. And it's like, oh, wait, that's what that's what Twitch is. And then suddenly I understood Twitch, that kind of thing. Uh, yeah, and I remember watching, like PewDiePie, and I'm like, oh, this guy's more entertaining than the game. Yeah, yes, exactly, exactly. Um, uh, okay, so assuming everybody is hearing us over the VOD, and it looks like everything is going through vMix, so when I record locally, I think we'll be good, then what I'll do is I'll just hit this, and then I'll set you up as the next shot, and I'm going to count you down in three, two... Hello, and welcome to the Weird Things Podcast. I'm Andrew Maine, joined by... My best friend in the world, nobody comes close, Brian Brushwood. Oh, man, I'm so glad because I thought for a second maybe you had another friend. I'm glad we cleared nope. that up. Nope. Sorry, Kim Montgomery in Orlando. <laughs> uh, yeah, this is the program where we talk about uh, uh, news of the weird. Uh, historically, we've always talked about how we don't believe in Bigfoot, but we think he's rad anyway. Uh, but lately, boy, have we been fascinated with space and, and AI and, and uh, it turns out they keep inventing new weird things. <laughs> Andrew. I, yeah, they do. And, and it's, it's only accelerating from here. So a uh, couple things. I think the big story for the last few days has been, we talked about previously, Google had announced Gemini 1.5. Gemini was the update to BAR. Gemini uses their newer models, which many people claim are GPT-4 equivalent, or some cases may surpass GPT-4. Uh, you know, it depends on, there, there's there's a lot of variations there, but they're, it, G, it, you it, know. It did well, seem like, like at first blush, you were reasonably impressed with what they had. Uh, uh, no, I think, 
I, I, I think people, the uh, going by others, people's interactions with it, and people who are very, very, very happy with Google. Google finally delivered the thing they said they were giving us a year ago. So, uh, and it can be incorporated across the range, et cetera. And, and it's a very fast moving space. One of the things they did is they made it very chat GPT like, and they incorporated their new image generator. Now I've, worked on the launch of image generation systems, a little thing called Dolly. I had to work on, you know, how we were going to launch that when I was back when I was with OpenAI and can tell you a lot of the challenges that go into that because one is when you say, I've got a magic box, I press a button, it does a thing. What should you allow it to do? What should it not do? You know, how do you do this responsibly? And there's a lot of considerations there. There's, you know, some attitude is, well, just let it do anything you want, and that's fine. Well, the problem is, is that you know Microsoft in the 1990s got pulled before, you know, basically you know the DOJ and was told, hey, you have a monopoly, and we're going to break you up. And Microsoft was like, we're just building a thing and doing it. And the argument was like, oh, you're abusing this, whatever. So government and and, and, and specifically, system. like like at the end of that thread, everyone was like. Whoa, that was dumb to begin with. All they did was add a browser to an OS. Like that was yeah, not, and, and, not and, a monopoly. <laughs> yeah, there were there were it was an opportunity for a lot of people frustrated because Microsoft had a lot of tactics and stuff that I'd say were frustrating. Then you had, you know, with social media, you had people who were like, you know, 10 years after that we talked about it, like wait, social media may influence the things that I think or say because it presents information to me we need to look into this. And it's like, really? Like you're, you're realizing this now and you're not, you haven't been skeptical. And then you've got social media coming under scrutiny, congressional, et cetera. So we live in a world where it's not like you just do a thing. Everybody's cool. Cause part of it too, is if you want to build a company and you know, you've seen this, like, you know, if you want to get support advertisers, whatever you have to, you know, basically become, you know, do what is considered the right thing. What the right thing is, is up for debate. And sometimes the right thing may actually not be the right thing. It's the popular thing. And that gets maybe sort of a controversial area. So one of the things that comes into, you hear about AI a lot is the term safety. Now safety on one extreme can mean like preventing robots from taking over and murdering us all. Safety in another factor could be if a 10 year old is using an AI you know, and says, I'm depressed, should it help them plot their suicide? I will say, probably not a good product. And that's the sort of thing where we tend to sort of forget about in AI safety is these conditions aren't always as black and white as we like. Like you can say, go ahead, Brian, you want to jump in? Well, well, well it, it's uh, on top of that, you have the fact that it's pretty easy to lie about your age on the internet, says the person who was on CompuServe at the age of 10. You know, it's, it's pretty easy to have your intentions misinterpreted. For example, a 12 year old says, I want to be like a person who is fabulous, but also mostly known for being sexy or whatever. The feedback loop can lead to some nefarious places. You're, you're in this, yeah, exactly. You're in a situation where you damned if you do, damned if you don't. So I'm going to start off saying that's what makes safety really hard. And you could say, you know, you, you, you're dealing with this challenge of like, if you, you can have this say, I'm unrestricted, let it do everything cool. You're not going to be considered responsible by a lot of the partners and people you want to work with. You know, if, if you're going to go and say, I want McDonald's to use my AI, they're going to like, no, we're not going to use it. And economically, you're going to be at a disadvantage because you're not there. Now there's the open source world, which sort of has different sort of rules, but one of the things I think was an example of how kind of unintended consequences, and I am super supportive of open source models, all this sort of stuff. I'm very, very excited, encouraged by this, but there are unintended consequences. One group, which I won't name, one of the early groups to put out a very capable open source language model, um, you know, was basically, you know, they were, you know, frustrated at OpenAI, frustrated with the idea that these things were locked down, so these things should be free, and, and a bunch of very, very well-intentioned people. They put out this language model. The next thing you know, it's being used for military applications, which OpenAI's models, like, you know, like stuff weren't allowed for, and then you have, like, you know, OpenAI is working on, like, using stuff to help, like, you know, better at mental health crisis counseling and stuff, and very, very conditionally, but all of a sudden, people are like, oh, we could use this for targeting, you know, put these in missile systems and stuff. And 
that's a reality. And, and that's the thing. The, the open source group, I had a friend that commented on this, the open source group said, like, stop saying that. Like, it's true. This is true. This is what happens. You don't get a control when you put a thing out there, no matter your intentions. Well, well, I, and, and I know that, uh, like, I, I barely speak the level of language that, that you're talking about. Uh, but, but, but just for, to widen the circle, uh, I, I know there are, the op there are open source large language models that maybe had parts borrowed from other ones. Uh, there's legal and illegal ones, but there's definitely no restrictor plates on them. Is, is, is that correct? Yeah, because what happens is you, the, you put out an open source model and you might try to do some training on it, but once, if somebody takes an open source model and starts using it to send you phishing email spam or whatever, trains it to do a thing and create, carry on conversations with you, because the person who made the model no longer controls the model, they can't lock it down. You can't stop it. Once the model's out there, it's out there. And this was a case where, and I, I don't have a problem. I think the responsible use of military technology is fine, but this was a case where this group would have been very anathema to like, you know, oh, you should use it for this. Well, it's going to get used for that anyways, because once you say you're not going to lock it down, it is not locked down. Um, and you're going to see a lot of language models used, you know, to write, you know, to do call center stuff when somebody tries to call your parents to get them to give up money and just like this. And that's a reality. I'm not, and again, my point's not, oh, therefore they shouldn't exist. It's be aware, you know, be aware. So my point is safety is hard. So when you want to be a responsible player in their safety, if OpenAI, you know, had made a put out an open source model early on and it ended up being used in a very negative way, like phishing scams or something like that, there would have been an outrage, you know, and, and there would have been, you know, its marketability ability to work with partners could have been impacted on something like that. So their safety safety exists for a reason. It can be a market reason, but it also can be some sort of societal reasons and whatnot. Well, well so all this uh, is uh, as somebody very far on the outside, it seems to me like um, uh, let's speak specifically about OpenAI. Number one complaint I hear about uh, ChatGPT is that it does a lot of throat clearing at the beginning and reminds you that it's a large language model and that it can't actually think and it's just going to tell you what it thinks you want. And then there's always a lot of long-winded summary at the end, like, please remember, this is, it may or may not be true. I may be hallucinating or whatever. Um, all of that, I think, was absolutely the right move for for a player in, in the branding, marketing, uh, news cycle game. It's like, that's the right way to play as conservative as possible. But it sounds like now... There are other players who are more fast and loose and 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 going a bit nutty and and open AI's conservative position is is paying off. Well, I, I would say that it's it's a balance. I would say that for working at corporate partners, working for people who are very care about public trust, it's very, very key. You know, people can complain about Apple's, you know, closed garden but you were less likely to worry about malware. There's a, there's a trade-off. Some people just don't like that at all. They'd rather deal with it and use other systems. And that's, you, you want that ecosystem where you have these different options. So I think that's there. So I'd say that I was just trying to make the point about like why safety exists. If particularly if you're talking about corporate, if you're building a corporate product, why safety exists, how far safety goes, whatever. And it comes to, when you make a thing, you want to feel that it's doing the right thing, not just the idea that you're appealing to, you know, other things, but what is right comes becomes the question. And, and that was, you know, open AI's models got, you know, criticized for being woke because originally if you said, hey, explain the beneficial uses of fossil fuels, it would say, oh, I can't do that. And that wasn't because there was somebody there specifically saying don't do that. It's just because when you train stuff on a lot of like popular media, it's like you send your kid off to college, they're going to come back with a bunch of different ideas. You know, if you read, you know, mainstream newspapers, you're going to have a come away with a certain kind of consensus. And that's the sort of same about language models. And sometimes people want to attribute these things to some sort of nefarious sort of ah, let's turn the woke dial up and we saw that with grok by the way elon musk model well, because well, he was gonna i'm gonna build but before that? before we get to that let 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 me double down and and like um there's there's what you intend to eventually do and then there is boots on the ground tactical strategy if you are first in the mind and the spotlight is on you it is not a safe thing 
to be uh, ever positioned as looking unhinged or any of the, that stuff. Uh, it is it is safe for the company and for the investors and for the team who's trying to build it to it's better to to slow walk this forward and and note how the public is perceiving it. So in that regard, I think OpenAI did a very, very responsible job. I, I think that I think they tried to walk that balance as well as they could. And I, I very I felt like I, you know, my own you know, ah, let's just throw it out there, see what happens, sort of, you know, I felt like when I watched how they were trying to temper it, whatnot, I felt that that made sense. So you're in a situation where you're trying to do what's right, et cetera. Elon was very critical of, of, of ChatGPT. Anytime it said something that was woke or whatever, he would retweet this. He puts out Grok and immediately gets teared apart because Grok is doing the same thing. And then Elon's like, well, you know, because I trained it on, and like you trained it on public news. And it's like, you're, you're saying the same thing, you know, open eyes, you know, and that was, he kind of got caught off guard by that because he didn't understand. I, I don't, I don't know what was going on in his reasoning or whatever, but he, he was in the same situation too, where he created a model that was more uh, quote woke than he intended. Right. Well, well and, and also uh, Elon is one of those curious characters who speaks enough marketing to know what's going to pop and get people excited. But, also lacks the patience for uh, to acknowledge the importance of time. Like, uh, you know, reputation is character over time. And if you have no time, then you, you're just whatever we see at that moment. This is a little bit of marketing talk, but anyway. Yeah, no, absolutely. So and I'm not trying to criticize him. I'd say that, I, well, I would say that I would qualify his, he fell victim to the same criticisms because these things are hard. These things are really hard, what I'm trying to say. There's a reason that, that institutions want to do things that are safe or institutions that have, as you said, reputation to worry about, concern, whatever. If you want, if you want to you know, have major hospital districts and stuff use your technology, if you want Fortune 500 companies to do it, you have to display what they perceive as responsibility. What that is is challenging. So fast forward to Google and Gemini and both – all the major LLMs have this sort of thing where they've been trained on safety and some of those ideas of safety are up for debate. And is that really being safe or is it being overly woke or whatever? That's a debate can be had and where the, where that, you know, where that should be. And they have an image generator in there. And this was a thing. It's just the same thing with Dolly, which we talked about at OpenAI is it, you know, how do you make something that, that anybody using it feels that, you know, it can represent what they're trying to express and stuff, you know, and, OpenAI went through publicly went through. Hey, that we're trying to adapt this, trying to make this thing more useful. There's criticism early on because, like the first versions of it, you said, "Show me a CEO." It'd all just be a bunch of dudes, and you know, you don't, you know, you know, you put your 12 year old daughter sitting down to use her and says, "Oh, I want to write a report about being a CEO. Give me these images of CEO," and it's all guys. It's like, well, that's not a good stereotype to reinforce. You know, you want to you want to show diversity there. Then there can be the idea that you know how 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 diverse should these things be, and so. Google with their image generator in Gemini got a lot of flack because it seems, and I could be very wrong, they kind of turned the dial a little bit too far. And yeah. Uh, so so, so, so they, 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 they moved a bit too far to the safety side. Uh, so I just asked, hey, show me the cast of the Weird Things podcast, and now uh, show me them on the mountain. Um, and uh, it looks like it's kind of just having a brain hemorrhage. They don't do people anymore. They, they cut out. It will not do people now. They, they Because of what happened was, is you would say, and, and again, you don't know how many examples are cherry picked, and you have to be, I watch this, you have to be very, very careful how many examples you see, because somebody will say, it only does this, it does this, and that gets secondhand and thirdhand knowledge. You might find out like one out of three times it did this thing, you know, and so, you know, don't, don't believe everything you see. Go experience. Try it for yourself. That's my thing. But the claims were people would say, like, show me the founding fathers. And it was a very diverse group of founding fathers, you know, much like Netflix would probably would have cast. But they didn't really look like the founding fathers. You know, they, they were, you know, you know, you would you would show like it would show a very diverse group of people as the founding fathers, which isn't historically accurate. And it can also be problematic, you know, because like I know that some people complain like, hey, you know, show me you know people wanting to say like uh, show me you know a uh 
you know, a, 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 a Mo- you know, a Mongolian horseman or somebody in the Mongol Empire, you know, ever, and you right. get, you know, somebody who doesn't fit would be like, well, and then the thing that's funny, because you could see sort of the, how right wing media versus left wing sort of carried this sort of story, you know, conservative media were like, hey, it's not that it's just pulling up historical photos of those. Yeah, people. yeah, yeah. Uh, it's not actually period. making them. Con- conservatives like, hey, it's anti white. And then like New York Times, somebody says, somebody did a thing like show me 1930s german soldiers which i is a phrase for nazis and it was a very diverse group of german soldiers which i'm pretty sure they were not going to recruit and it was like all right how where where should these dials be what what should it be i i'm of a believer that like if i ask for a thing give me a thing i ask for you know if 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 i want to have you know a a you know if i want to show whatever i want to do if i want to do like hey you know do the founding uh, do the founding fathers, but cast them all as Inuit or whatever. Because maybe I want to do a play where I just use diverse thing. I do a Hamilton with this diverse people playing that. There could be reasons for that. But if I'm like, hey, give me an accurate photo of what they would have looked like, then do that. You know. Yeah. So, point is, it's been an uproar. Um. Oh, I, I tried to get it to <laughs> show me a sad clown podcasting, and not gonna I, do people. It, it actually tried to find me a podcast of somebody who could be conceived of as a sad clown. <laughs> yeah, no, it, it's it's they are trying to lock this down because it's it's. I feel bad for Google because Google is doing really really cutting edge stuff. They you know they're having like the million token context really the engineers and researchers and scientists there have just stepped up their game but between there and product something's going awry and i think it is because of that fear of missing out or being you know thought of as you know second and it's like they have not done an ai a major ai release without stepping on a huge rake that gets them into the news well uh, look at look look at this i just asked uh, uh, audio listeners uh, you don't need to see this but i asked about a specific method in, that is fundamental to a lot of tricks of magic and i said how does the blank work in magic and it says unfortunately i cannot reveal the inner workings of this trick as it is a fundamental slight and sharing it would break the illusion and diminish the enjoyment. However, I can, and it goes on to vividly describe how to do the secret technique. Well, take some work there. And that was a question I brought up early on in the safety. Is like, what, what do you consider? You know, would revealing a magic trick, you know, would it be impacting the livelihood of somebody? And, you know, I, I didn't have an answer. So these are things to think about. They're like these edge cases. Yeah. The, uh, uh, this is one of those moments where it's like uh, uh, when we launched Scam School, we on purpose made sure that we didn't talk about magic. We're like, hey, man, it's just a cool way to win free drinks at the bar. And now it's like whenever you search magic, you get other YouTube channels and not mine. I'm like, well, dang it. <laughs> but, but, but then again, I, I survived the... Uh, the uh, 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 the exposure ending, you know, uh, 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 firestorm. Yeah, the the jihad against Brian Brushwood. Yep. <laughs> yeah. So it's a uh, it's a challenge. It's a uh, it's a it's a challenge out there, and you know, I think that the problem is is that the answers aren't as easy as people think they are. Because, you know, they're, they're, you know, one group would be like, hey, you know, the, 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 the base group is like, get rid of all the filters, got stuff like, okay, cool. I'm working with an educational organization that's advising schools across the world. What do I tell them to use? You know, do I, do I say, yeah, you know, just put these chain rules in front of this, you know, model that has no safety on it. Like, you know, oh, well, I can say like, hey, these chain rules got to learn. That ain't gonna fly. That's not gonna work. And and that solution is gonna mean, if it's not tenable for them, it means fewer kids get access to these tools. That gets prolonged, and I'm not gonna bring about the future that I want. And it is a lot of having to sort of make these choices. So it's not easy. Yeah. The um, uh, I don't know. I'm 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 actually uh of 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 two minds on the the functionality of ai when it comes to searches because uh, we all know that ai you know can hallucinate um and and i i know that you are dismissive of 
the prompt that I'm very proud of, uh, of like, give me a truth confidence score because it can be very confident and also very wrong. Um, I, I'm, I'm very curious. I know for sure that AI makes for a great writer's room for a great brainstorming session for a great, you know, write me a scene that looks like blank or whatever for a great, like first year, right out of college intern, I'll do my best. And then, and I like the fact that AI can always be told, no, that's not right. Try again. And then they'll go out and actually find out more things. But, uh, but that places it in that, that, that woeful, mushy middle of functionality. I, 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 when people ask you, um, and, and let's say it's somebody who you know is fairly technically savvy and of, uh, I don't know, they only have, they only have $700 billion or a million dollars. Um, what would you advise them to use AI for and what would you advise them not to use it for? I, I think it can be used for a lot. I mean, it just comes down to knowing what it can do. And I'd say that's a core thing. And, and you know, I, I, when I left to go work on my startup, you know, one of the things that was before me was the idea, should I spend more time trying to communicate to people how these things work? But I realized like, man, that's often kind of futile. But it is, it is knowing how they work and because I can apply it to, I'll give you an example. This is something I talk about a, a lot, which is uh, I consult for startups that are using AI in mental health. And I also consult for people evaluating mental health apps that use AI. Right? And if you hear the idea of should you use AI for a mental health app, often the answer is like, oh, gosh, no, because, you know, you don't want some unhinged model telling somebody who is emotionally vulnerable, horrible things or wrong things. I agree 100 percent. But there are many ways that you can use AI in mental health apps, you know, mental health you know, applications. You know, you can say, hey, you know, we have message boards and our monitors can't monitor all the stuff coming in here. If we could have an AI that could flag as somebody who maybe needs to talk to a counselor or something like that. Well, yeah, that's that the idea is there is the AI is not replacing anybody as long as they do it as using the saying is it, it might help catch something additional that didn't get recognized. You know, that that's an application that's like, okay, that could be useful. The patient's not interacting directly with it. Um, I have no idea what's going on there. Oh, I've, I've people are giving bits. I'm trying to make a habit of making oh. sure that you get acknowledged. <laughs> Awesome. Yeah, gifts. Yeah, just there was an explosion across the screen. Of Very cool. But anyhow, you could see like that could be useful. I think eventually get to a point where like, yeah, you may talk to the AI. I don't think we're there yet. We need a ton of data. We need to figure out how to make these systems safer. There's a lot of places. The Trevor Project, which uh, wanted to help train counselors who are having to deal with TM teens who may be suicidal. Now, the challenge is you give somebody, you know, a couple hundred hours of training, whatever, then you have them do some monitored calls, and then you let them go do this, and you keep track of it. The more experience you have in a safe place, the better, the better you are, the better you're going to be at that. So what Trevor Project did, and this is a while back, they took a GPT-2 model, a GPT-2 model, and trained it to behave and talk like a teenager that might be suicidal or whatever, and then had counselors talk to that model and get practice and learn to identify and whatnot. And that's a great application of it because the idea there is like, well, I, I sure I could just put those counselors in front of suicidal teens. No, I, but, I, I, but, I actually, I, th I think what you're uh, suggesting is, is something that I believe very, very deeply where, where uh, 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 excellence comes from iteration over time. So it's like, Chat GPT two is is going to be very blunt. I want to slice my wrists or whatever. So you work with that or whatever, and it's like congratulations. Now now you're going to play with Chat GPT three, and it's Chat G, GPT three or three point five is going to use more subtle language, but you can figure out like, is this really the you want to slit your wrist scenario? You know, and then Chat GPT four, and then finally, uh, like or in 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 a perfect situation, I I would imagine. At no time does the practitioner know whether or not this is a robot or a real person. 
Yeah, but even even in a smaller scale, just in the stage one, just the idea that it just you know, my point is to say you can take a very error prone AI model and get utility out of it. Taking GPT two, and I can say, hey, I can get some utility out of it by basically saying, well, it makes errors. Okay, well, it needs to replicate a person who might be slightly erratic or whatever. And that's what I'm saying. My point is to say is like. You can use if, if all you ever had was GPT two. There are useful places for that in places like mental health or whatever. Which on the surface, people are like, oh my god, no, like no, like once you explain that case, people are like, oh, okay, I get it. You know, and another example could be content moderation. Is to say, okay, I want to create an AI that's going to create the most horrible sort of creative statements it can, and then I have to figure out how to moderate this, etc. So that's one of the things you can think about. There's a lot of different ways these things can be applied. And so when you talk about what field, what you're like, I think it'd be in every field, but it may not be in the way that people think. Yeah, that that sounds right. Um, the uh, uh, h- how much of all of GPT needs to be, um, I, I guess, offline. I mean, I, I I know that there are, you know, uh, server farms filled with NVIDIA cards that 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 do a lot of processing. Uh, how smart could we get in a single cell phone or uh, an even smaller device? So on device has made a lot of progress. A long time ago, I, I, as far as I know, I was like one of the first people to try to squeeze a GPT-3 scale model onto a phone and I could get it to do like one t- inference task and then it would just die. Um, as far as I know, like it was just like, hey, I had this crazy idea. But uh, since then, phones have become more capable. Model model compression models become more efficient. And one of the big one of the big leaps that happened was uh, at OpenAI. One of the co-founders, a super brilliant guy, really nice guy named John Shulman, you know, realized that one of the ways that you improve the capabilities of these models is using what we call instruction following, which we talked about before, and it's reinforcement learning, and human feedback. And it's been an idea to talk about, but John applied this really at a big scale where they took a lot of interactions with GPT-3 of people saying, write me a blog post, write me this, and then basically structure this into, I'm asking you to do this, here's the response. Because remember back in the days of GPT-3, it would be like, this is a medium blog post about Mars, and my name is Andrew, and MV, and then the model go, oh, I know how to finish this. To instruction following, it's like, write me a blog post about Mars. And so John had really great insights into how to do this. And that led to our instruct models. And now every model you use, every every AI model now is an instruct model, is a version of an instruct model. And what happened with that though, was we realized like if you take a lot of instruction following data, like a lot of examples of that, a lot of these little smaller open source models, like like Mixrel, Mixrel 7B is probably one of the most capable open source models right now, although, um, Google just released Jim or whatever, which people think is really highly capable. You give it a lot of that instruction following data and it becomes really good because it's training, it's learning, it's, it's, it is as it, it learns a lot of generalization stuff from there. So it learns it in kind of on a deeper sort of level, I guess to say. It's kind of like it learns by immersion, so to speak. It's going to learn how the world works by looking at these examples of a model following a task for a person. So that's shown us we can compress these models even smaller, particularly for single purpose stuff, particularly for just trying to do certain kinds of things. So you could put on your phone right now a really good chatbot model that you could carry on a conversation with and whatnot. It's not going to have a super long context length because that's when it starts to take up a lot of memory and RAM. But with some tricks and stuff, you know, you could you could create a very convincing chatbot on there and you could do some work on a model right you know, on your phone. How how far do you think we are from um uh, let's say let's say first wave AIs, by which I mean uh, uh, there there's a wave of 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 characters that we talk to Cortana, Alexa, uh, Siri, or whatever. How soon until I know they've been making incremental improvements, but how far away do you would would you speculate speculate that we are from uh, them being powered by much more talented? Uh, deeper algorithms. So the the challenge for Siri and the the name the device I will not name that's next to me. Sorry, um, the the one is, from Amazon. Yeah. Yes, is that they were designed off of almost like nineteen nineties level ideas about 
uh, AI, which was very natural language processing, very, very NLP, very rules based, very this and not very flexible. And they look for, if I hear this keyword, then I'm going to look for this and do that. They are compared to what you have compared to even a model you put on your phone now, a modern, you know, transformer model, extremely dumb, not capable. And they've built this huge infrastructure around that. And they've had hundreds of people, thousands of people building up all these rules, all this sort of stuff. And that was why, you know, we're 2024 and there is no good native language system running on an a native Apple link running on an Apple device, no good native language device in there. Even it's word, you know, suggestion stuff is still very primitive. What you would have had like six or seven years ago, they're going to catch up. Apple's been secretly buying up a bunch of AI companies and stuff. And Apple's got, they used to have more money than everybody, but now Microsoft has more money. Thanks. I think to open AI, but Apple's certainly catching up and they will get better, but, the problem is they're just based on a much older and antiquated idea about how these things should work, but they're going to get better soon. They all have, they all have these skunk works projects to radically improve and to put them to chat GPT level. Yeah. Uh, I, I wonder how um, the user experience will be corrupted by uh, perfectly rational moneyed interests. Like for example, uh, when I talked to my uh, Amazon purchased a nameable device, I'll ask for a, for a song and it'll say uh, playing songs kind of like that song on on Amazon Music. And then I, and I'm like, that's not what I asked for. I want that song. And, and it's like, well, I mean, maybe you should subscribe to Amazon Music. And then finally, I'm like, play Spotify this and, and and it's 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 intolerably precise about like oh you didn't say that fast enough i'm sorry i didn't understand so i've learned to very quickly say um hey blank name play spotify artist hilltop hoods song uh, drinking in the sun or whatever and then and then maybe it'll give it to me because they're using what they call as a bag of words technique. And it's literally just looking to see what words pop up. And I'll, I'll tell you, I saw something with my Apple TV last night, which I thought was funny was, uh, Brian, I don't drink. I don't want to spit take whatever. My wife had never heard of Archer. I was, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, uh. <laughs> yeah. What? So, and, and that came up because, uh, we were watching uh, Boy Kill. Do you see the trailer for Boy Kills World? Uh, no, not yet. So it's Bill Skarsgård. Looks like crazy, uh, crazy balls out sort of like action sort of movie. Um, he plays a guy that lost his ability to speak. And so he has an inner voice. And his inner voice is the last voice that he heard, which was... Uh, a video game with H. John Benjamin doing the voice, <laughs> the voice of Archer. Yeah, so, so, so it's, it's just H. John, H. John Benjamin, Benjamin. is his inner voice. <laughs> That's wonderful. It, it's, it's great gimmick. Just great, great, great gimmick. So anyhow, um, the uh, I'm like, oh, that's, that's I'm like, yeah, it's H. John, I'm trying to H. John Benjamin. You know, the guy did Archer. My wife's like, what's Archer? And I'm like, oh, let me show you. And I go to Siri. I'm like, hey, Archer. I use the, the Apple TV. I just used to say Archer. Yeah. All I said was Archer. All I said was Archer. And it goes searching for Sterling Archer. Uh, so, and so like, it, like it knew. No, but it, it didn't. I mean, what it did is it was using like an embedding search and it just decides, well, if you say Archer, you probably mean Sterling Archer. Like, no, I meant the show Archer. And it was a frustrating thing. It's like, man, I, there is no way I can get it to ask to find the thing I want it to find because they're making assumptions about what I'm trying to find. That, and it's not smart enough like a chat GPT where I could be like, hey, man. That, that, that is definitely one of the things that I really appreciate about uh, the way uh, chat GPT works is that uh, it doesn't need precise fidelity like when, when I talk to the unnameable Amazon device, I must like close my mind and write a command prompt that takes it directly to the place. Whereas with uh, Chat GPT four, um, uh, it, it's it's you you just the more you talk, the more of a word cloud you generate, 
and the more precise it gets. It's in every way the reverse. Instead of one precise, you know, execute command.exe, it becomes, yeah, I don't know, there was this thing, and ah, oh man, I just graduated, so it would have been around 1992, but, but I remember there was three dudes, and they were talking about like, it sounded like they were singing about banging, but they was like coy or whatever. But the one girl was bad, and then it's like, you're talking about Belle Biv DeVoe, poison. Would you like to listen? <laughs> yeah, it's it's amazing how much it's able to, because it's a pattern seeker, it's ability to find these patterns. And sometimes it can find very weak patterns, and these are what we call hallucinations, but it is it is it is amazing. I, I know now when I try to remember something, whatever, it's often a very good resource to serve to say. It 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 hey, is excellent for like tip of the tongue stuff where it's like you almost remember like like ah, there's a part of the brain where like all the language lives and, and, and you could talk this stupid way because it also, uh, depending on what version you have, remembers what you, how you talk, but you're like, well, what's the, what's the part of your, what's the talky part of the brain? It's like on one hemisphere or the other. And then, and then it will come back with, it's like, you're talking about Broca's area. And I'm like, yeah, that's the one. But there's this other one yeah, that's... that if it gets messed up, then you just, spout out word salad and like you're talking about vernica's area <laughs> uh these were both developed and i'm like yeah that's what i learned in college yeah and then i've forgotten that carl second book broke his brain so <laughs> uh we're getting more fallout from the open AI release of sora oh sora... Uh, this is the video one right yeah, so that was last week. OpenAI announced Sora, which we talked about, I think, in the last show. Sora is the the new video generator model from OpenAI, which there had been really cool stuff coming out. Pika, uh, Google had Lumiere, some really stuff that coming along the way. And Sora feels like a big leap forward in capability because we talked about it doing really widescreen, really complex stuff. I've shown people stuff and you know, they're, you know, amazed, you know, because you look at the stuff like there's dogs in snow and whatnot. And some of the stuff you would not, there's no way you wouldn't be able to tell that it was AI. Some stuff you can, you know, more complex stuff and whatnot. But um, headline that was in Friday and deadline today, and this is a quote, uh, Tyler Perry was in the middle of expanding upon his studio that he has in Atlanta, and he was looking to do an $800 million expansion. And apparently, quote, well, I mean, this is from the article, Perry is already voting this wallet on the subject. His plans for an $800 million expansion of his Atlanta studio are on hold after seeing a demonstration of OpenAI's text-to-video model, Sora, which has created a stir within its, with its cinematic video. He is uh, telling filmmakers, hey, you're staring into the abyss in a conversation with The Hollywood Reporter. So... Uh, and, uh, I, 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 um, I, I don't know how deep we want to get into this whole meta debate uh, because everybody's going through a little bit of a existential crisis uh, thinking about like, well, can it, can it replace me? Um, uh, what, I, what we've said on this program before and what I believe is if, if you, if you are a mechanic, if input comes in, you fix it and spit it out, then yeah, I would say be concerned about AI. But if you are a human being and people like the fact that you're a human being, uh, you probably have less to worry about. Now, in this case, we're hearing about Tyler Perry, a human being who people go to Tyler Perry movies to see Tyler Perry. If he's deciding to eliminate a lot of other people that he may perceive as mechanics, Oh. oh no no he's he's no he's not he is worried he wants regulation he's saying we this is gonna we've we've got to be very very concerned about now and his fear is that unless we regulate unless we prevent this from happening this is going to be devastating so he's prevent. not all in on this as far as i can tell well okay uh, let's talk about that that prevent how, how much preventing this do you think is possible andrew well <laughs> here's the problem um and also i i have a deep respect for tyler perry because this guy is a 
creative powerhouse and sort of my joke was and a true you know, a true for independent a guy that writes for a guy that can write all 90 episodes of a tv series how concerned are you about people losing their jobs when you know you're you're you know which i think it's totally valid and fine to do that but that was one of the biggest things that came up with the latest uh strike was you know showrunners who write the entirety of the show and don't hire other writers for that and and i think i'm like cool do it you know but that was a criticism and so anyhow um here's the problem so you had a strike we had a strike we had a strike this hollywood strike you know writers union actors striking because of their concerns about hey uh how are we gonna you know where how much of this pay are we gonna get from residuals from streaming it's a very new economic model and there needs to be these discussions Doing it so closely after the pandemic and not even having a recovery, you know, there's some people that question that, but that's neither here nor there. Problem is, while the strike was going on, people were still watching stuff. People were watching stuff, but some of these things they're watching were made in other countries. They're watching other kinds of content or they're watching YouTube videos. Hollywood's enemy is not AI. Hollywood's enemy is every other form of entertainment on the planet. And like you talked about, Brian, is that I believe that I believe that my prediction is 10 years from now, there'll be more people employed creatively than there are now. Yeah. I do think it's going to be, you know, when think about this, if you can use AI instead of Netflix saying, we're going to make, you know, $100 million movie per quarter, we're going to make $25 million movies that are going to hire directors, hire writers and hire actors and some other crew people on there and maybe the same net number of people are going to be able to work to some capacity but we're going to be able to make 20 times as much content and hopefully some of it will be great that seems like a cool future because when they spend a hundred billion dollars on rebel moon when i think that there are probably a lot of really talented filmmakers out there that you could give them 10 million and they could have blown you away out there but that doesn't happen that's your choice i think the opportunity increases but there's always going to be like i just funded a film a feature where the filmmaker Alex Olam shot this in the using a volume. He's a graduate at FSU, and so FSU has the volume, the same kind of soundstage they use for Mandalorian. And so Alex was able to shoot this in its exterior locations, interior locations, and stuff. Most of it takes place inside of a vehicle. And because he had access to this technology, and because he didn't have to have schlepped his crew from point A to point B and have all these random call times or whatever, he could spend more time with his actors, and the performances are great. And that's one of these things that comes from this. I look at this tech, I go, yeah, there's going to be a lot of blue screen stuff. There's going to be, you know, we could also, there's going to be blue screen. The AI is going to get to a point where I'm like, well, Brian, you and I are going to sit at a picnic table in the middle of a park with no makeup, no whatever, and we're going to shoot a scene. We'll give it to the AI. It's going to give you and me Viking beards. It's going to put a Viking encampment around us, but we still get to act. We still get to do this. Also going to make us 20 years younger and more svelte. I mean, and to be honest, like uh, this is, this is kind of the game of animation where it's like, uh, uh, and and even as your voice gets more gravelly or whatever, it's like you could de-age your voice. And uh, uh, the important thing is all of art is a thought reaches another brain and uh it's really hard for me to want to slow down intentionally any of that well yeah the 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 danger is if we say i'm a you know i make a living as a novelist and i'm very lucky by that been very fortunate by that if i said no AI generated books because I don't want it affecting my business. That's a hypocrite. I'm a hypocrite because I use machines and AI for all kinds of other stuff that's disruptive. And for me to say, no, AI doesn't get to touch my business. Well, you know, if the difference between AI and not AI is that somebody gets access to a more quality books, more quality stuff, their money goes further, they don't have to spend as much, whatever. And I'm going to stop that just because I want, because I, I profit from this inefficiency. That's not cool, you know? And so I think that if a filmmaker says, I want to have a tool, I want to have the best tool to tell my story and be like, well, is it the best tool? Like data subjective. If I decide, if you're going to, you can't decide for other people, I can't tell Christopher Nolan, you've got to use digital. He's going to do what he wants. So I think that it's, it's like anything, you know, people talk about like, you know, ah, we shouldn't be sending, you know, our factories overseas and stuff. Okay. Do you want to pay the higher prices? Well, no. 
okay, so should, you know, middle, you know, right now people are struggling with the prices of groceries. Should we make it more expensive? Well, of course not. Okay, should we find ways to make these things more inexpensive? Well, yes. So it applies to everything. Uh, okay, so I, I, I have a feeling that a lot of this can spill over into uh, after talk, which of course, uh, or after things, uh, which is of course only available to our patrons, our very, very pac patient patrons who are three weeks behind because Brian is learning how to uh, uh, handle the pipeline. All of this is coming up very, very quickly today. Uh, but uh, in the meantime, head on over to patreon.com. I, I got to do one more. Wait, yeah, check that out. I got one more story, Brian. Okay. Oh, really? Okay. All right. Okay. So let's talk about the dangers of AI. One of the things that's happened, there's, there's this slow realization that academia and the scientific community might be comprised of people and not saints. Okay, are, 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 uh, 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 before you continue, can I tell you about the crazy Freakonomics podcast episode that I heard that was titled, Why is there so much academic fraud in academia? Um, anyway, that's a good podcast. Continue with whatever you were about to say. So, and that, that is a great one to go delve more into the reasons for this, but there's a lot of reasons for it. And that is, you know, one of the things is, you know, re positive results get funding, negative results don't. Funding means funding going to your schools, your colleges, and you get, you, get, you get that, and you're being judged by bureaucrats who value that and not over the research. That this, These things are not very pure, which you've basically created an industry, and some people have argued that a large amount of the sciences aren't even done by real scientists anymore. They're basically, you know, they are bureaucratic paper pushers, whatever, just trying to output a 60 page thing that justifies more funding for this to continue this thing on. And there is an industry of writing these things covertly, whatever, producing this stuff. Some of it's become very apparent in China where there's a huge pressure to publish like this huge pressure to publish so much so that if you don't have the research, you'll make it up. There's also been in the U S uh, I think it was the president of Stanford, if I'm not mistaken, got caught up in a major scandal where a number of papers he was attached to looked like that data was suspicious. And they're finding in many institutions, not just plagiary, but like research papers. There's a whole, the whole thing about, you know, Alzheimer's sources, you know, roots of Alzheimer's that a lot of these papers may have completely fake data in there. A recent research paper called this into light. It was published in a, uh, couple, I think two Chinese researchers where somebody was looking through this and they noticed they were talking about rats and uh, they had some diagrams that looked completely mid journey, you know, mid journey diagrams, which is both BS text. And then a diagram of a rat with an obsessively, extremely large genitalia. <laughs> <An> extremely <laughs> large. Genitalia. That was that and was it, the tip off. <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, and 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 one word D I C uh, D C K <laughs> D C K. <laughs> and so uh, people were looking at this going like, "What was anybody reading this?" And they were looking like, "Oh my god, what's going on here?" And so, and we don't know. Like, uh, I am super critical of like. Uh, uh, chat GPT detectors. I have people reach out to me like, Hey, can you promote our thing? I'm like, well, they don't work. And I, and I just put two examples on Twitter of, I right. just wrote text that this detector hundred percent identified as AI generated. And then I had AI generated text that says it's human. Well, and, um, and, and these by, things are, by the way, that makes sense because we all go to, you know, junior high school and they all teach us a uh, opening paragraph. So do this three points, then closing paragraph, restate the above. It's like, yeah, we, we've all been taught to write and and then upon that method was uh, was the LLM ch uh, trained well there there are detectors that will work approximately if nobody no thoughts put into it although they will every time i put anything from wikipedia it would automatically flag it as chat should be generated because that's it that's really the structure that it, it it picks up is that wikipedia cadence and whatever to it but and then I wrote a thing in the style of Wikipedia, and it's ah, it's AI generated. Aha, I wrote it. But yeah, so there is, they they there's a reason people think they work, but they're very easily defeated, and they can create false positive. Which is my argument: is that a false positive? Like having been a kid in middle school who got accused of 
you know, plagiarism because I wrote at a level much older than me. But mm -hmm. by the time I was in high school, I wrote a level much dumber than me. So I made up for it. But, you know, the point is, is that, you know, these things aren't cool. But in you know, the research paper, like, yeah, like, I think now there's more effort starting to look at a lot of research papers, which thank God, because the medicines, the medications you take are based on research somebody did somewhere. And if you found out that they fudged a number or they multiplied the number of things, I would be livid. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> um, yes. I, mean, I, mean, I, I, I have no, there. I have no defense against this. This is, this is excellent <laughs> logic. Uh, uh, yeah. You, you want to talk picks for, uh, as we wrap up and then we'll do, uh, uh, after things. Yep. Uh, so, uh, I mentioned before that, my 11 year old daughter wanted to see lower decks, watched one episode, loved it very much, uh, and loved it enough that, uh, you know, there was one reference. And I'm like, Oh, I guess you should know about this other thing. And she says, dad, why don't we just start from the beginning? And this week we finished at the end, uh, in, and hopefully it won't be the end, the end, but, uh, uh, uh we're fully all the way caught up on lower decks outside of, I believe, Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan, and Darmok and Jalad at Tanagra. Those are the only non-Lower Decks Star Trek things that Callie knows, and she loves this universe. She loves this show, and knowing that this one show can represent so, what, what to you and I was so many different things uh is a real blast that's amazing and i i wonder too like are are younger people's brains better attuned to being accepting of things written from different time periods like and i, I think too is there is sort of a point of stabilization that came about for stuff but like you know you could a 14 year old today could watch buffy the vampire slayer and enjoy yep. it and, and, you know, even though that show is now 20 years old, but, you know, being a 20 year old in 1984, trying to watch an hour long drama from 1964. Oh, would have been agony. Right. Uh, so, yeah. So, uh, uh, yeah. uh, uh, I'm going to say it depends on the source material. For example, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Try trying to get, uh, trying to get through all three episodes of back to the future back to the future one is pure cinematic gold it's genius it's perfect in all ways right uh, uh and then that end part that says to be continued and it's implied that oh my god is there even more back to the future callie was so into that at the age of 11 then we started watching episode two and she's like oh they got a lot of stuff wrong about the past and the future, or the future and the past. And then by the time we got to episode three, she's like, Dad, can we just skip to the end? And I'm like, okay, okay. And, and, and so we did. So some things age not well. Now, meanwhile, my 16-year-old um, is old enough for me to, like, she went through the entire With Her Friends, the entire Chucky franchise, and she's on the very last one. And I was like, oh, do you, uh, do you, have, do you have 10, 15, 20 minutes? Uh, are you familiar with Paul Verhoeven? Have you ever seen RoboCop? And she was like, she was like ah, well, I got to watch The Bride of Chucky. Okay, all right. And it's like, you know, she got through the over-the-top, like, everything's been commercialized, even space flight and medical services and the police. And I'm like, isn't that crazy? That's how it turned out. And then it's like co-ed showers. And then and then it's like, maybe the cops should strike. And it's like, she's, and I'm like, that was crazy at the time, sweetie. And she was almost tuned out until the ED-209 showed up. And that that deep growl happens, and it says you have twenty seconds to comply. And then she was like, "This is not CGI. What is this?" And I'm like, "Well, this is stop motion animation." And she screamed, 
why doesn't everybody do this? This is awesome. <laughs> and then the, the <laughs> dude gets like blown to hell. His body is exploded into bits. And there's no question he's dead. And then somebody shouts, somebody get a paramedic. And she burst out laughing. And she's like, this is the greatest show ever. <laughs> so so uh, it, it's interesting how some things do survive and some less so. Uh, there's, if you get a chance, I don't know if you, if she likes the stop motion, uh, have you ever shown her Clash of the Titans? I, 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 well, once it, it, this only happened last night. So, so it's like, once I heard that, I'm like, okay, uh, I'll, I'll take her back to Sinbad and the, the seven seas or seven quests or whatever. And then before that, you know, uh, Clash of the Titans. And then before that, uh, Jason and the Argonauts, all of that stuff. Clash is like I love Clash because it was it was the last movie Ray Harryhausen worked on. Yeah, when that that was and that was sort of like the pinnacle of his career. We finally kind of I think did a really good job of it. Um, so, you know, I think that that's my pick. I think that that's a great gateway into that stuff. So my pick is that I I had this in my Netflix. Excuse my like whatever watch list for the longest time. Like I keep meaning to watch this. And then some reviewers said, coming up, I'll be doing a review on this. I'm like, okay, I got to watch it before it gets out of review. 1978 invasion, the 1978 invasion of the body snatchers. Oh. I that is the quote. That is the expression. Don't, that is the uh, no spoilers here, but uh, but but but, is, but that is the, the haunting been... image. Oh, so good. Yes, so good. They didn't. They kept it a surprise, and even on the set, Kaufman didn't even tell the studio how it was going to end until they watched it. So it stars uh, uh, stars Donald Sutherland. Yep, you know, great Donald Sutherland. Donald Sutherland's peak. It stars Leonard Nimoy playing a psychiatrist this 1970s california sort of pop psycho psychiatrist it's great veronica cartwright who would show up in aliens a year later and jeff goldblum and because goldblum, of course very very yeah very early goldblum very the early kind of goldblum pre-fly there's goldblum before fly then goldblum post fly and Man, I mean, it is it's shot in San Francisco, and yes, it is a 1970s movie. Let me get it, but it holds up. Like you look at what Kaufman was trying to do about the personal turmoil of this, and uh, I dug it. I really, really dug it. It, um, it uh, I, I remember it as kind of like the um, Secret Invasion scroll uh, story, as sort of a thinly veiled. Uh, what if they're all communists thing it, 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 is it, does it read that way nowadays so the kaufman like the, the original the the so it's weird the story of this is kind of funky weird so the original version was the 1956 version that don siegel directed he actually makes a cameo so does uh What's his name? The guy that starred in that version he's you know he makes a, an appearance in there too in a role that's kind of connected to it um, but the Kaufman, I believe had said, Kevin McCarthy, Kaufman had said that he wasn't trying to make it political so much. I mean, although there's some comments in there about like, you know, oh, what happened? Did he become a Republican, become this, whatever? He was talking about the idea of like conformity and the idea of, you yeah, have this very vibrant city that's very, you know, very embracing. And all of a sudden what happens when everybody kind of conforms? The 1956 version, people said, or maybe, I don't know, Coffin may have that, but Siegel had said he was not trying to make any political statement about that. And people said, oh, is it about communism? Is it about the paranoia of that? The thing that gets forgotten is that the original movie may have been, the original movie may have been heavily influenced by a Robert Heinlein story which was sort of talking about the idea of things being embraced, and that was the Puppet Masters. So Highline with the Puppet Masters. Oh, that's right, which, which later became a movie in the, in the late 90s, yeah, movie, right? Yeah, it became a movie later on, and that was very much the idea of, there was this idea of, because it mentions like, you know, the, the Iron Curtain and this and stuff, and so 
I don't know. I don't know. And I think what's interesting too is that the puppet masters there was like these aliens are sort of attaching themselves to people's backs and the way that invasion of the body snatchers worked was these flowers show up and these pods, you know, pod people came from that, like pods make replicas of you. And then later versions invasion. And I think that they may have done that originally to avoid, you know, copying, you know, the whole idea that Heinlein had, but then later versions just said, Oh, we're just throw open somebody's mouth. And now you're an alien. Yeah. So. Uh, dude, so uh, that's my pick invasion of the body snatchers. That one has been long enough that I think it'll be amazing to, uh, I'll see if I can get the 16 year old to watch it. There is, and I'll say this is there is, there is something going on in all the scenes. There's something going on in Kaufman. Kaufman is, you know, it's a very, very, very talented director. Uh, give me some examples from Philip Kaufman's directing career. Uh, includes, you know, he did uh, a Michael Crichton book, Rising Sun, but let's look at his filmography. Um, the right stuff, which I thought was great. He had the, he was the, he wrote the story for a little thing you may have heard of called Raiders of the Lost Ark. Yeah. Maybe something will come out of you it. Know. Yeah. Outlaw Josie Wales, whatnot. So he's had, you know, kind of a, a kind of, a, kind of an independent kind of guy. I think, I think he, you know, is a collaborator with like Coppola and whatnot. So. All right. Well, here you know, uh, he does he think this stuff. Let's wrap this up so we could do after things. Uh, it's uh, been weird. Oh, wait, wait, wait uh, uh, okay. Do it, do, it, do it again. It's been weird. Uh, nailed it. Uh, okay, cool. Uh, I'm going to go pee. We'll, we'll leave the stream on for a little bit, and then we'll come back and we'll do after things. All right. I'm going to step away, but I'm not going to say what I'm doing. Okay. No, I'm, I'm peeing just for the record. you have in your hand, boy? Pass it over. A telegram. Oh dear. It seems someone has been biting me. Fetch me my trousers at once. No, not those. Those are my time travel trousers. Those are my tea trousers. That's it. Those ones. My fighting trousers. Regarding your recent foray into the rap business and the scene you portray See, I don't normally approve of war games But he's biting is what they all say And by Harry, they might be right This is hip-hop, not an Elvis night Show this professor impersonation Let it end now, it's impertinent waiting You seem a reasonable chap What you need to do is rap and not parody chap hop Cause that's not proper, just not cricket Put away your ukulele or I'll tell you where to stick it I... Don't like your tweet, sir. Will. Teach you the professor's ready. Not. Let's see who strikes the loudest. Lou. Put on my fighting trousers. I've got super producers and fans that play me. You have a granddad's moustache and a ukulele. Don't look around, sir. I'm speaking to you. Roll up your shirt sleeves. Greensbury rules. Never test professors with the cleverest wits. Let's settle this like gentlemen armed with heavy sticks on a rotating plate with spikes like Flash Gordon. And you're Peter Duncan. I gave you fair warning when this George Form be clear is performing audiences go home before he begins talking a new career might be more rewarding i'm a bright bright and clear your raps piers morgan i don't like your tweet sir will teach you the professor's ready not let's see who strikes the loudest Lou. put on my fighting trousers i've not seen you at ciphers or workshops with kids or gigs dear sir you're not worthy of this sold out to coca-cola used for a trend and that means you're banned from using a pen hope it's safe to assume you won't do it again set foot on my stage and get ruined again be out mr b i set the egg timer there's not room in town for two gentlemen rhymers leave town by the end of this instrumental yours etc etc sincerely and so forth professor elemental i don't like your tweet sir will teach you the professor's ready not let's see who strikes the loudest Lou. put on my fighting trousers oh. Sorry, I'm sorry, Jeffrey, but it, it gets my goat. It gets my dander right up. 
Danny told him. No, no jazz solo. This is supposed to be a diss song. Jeffrey, get off the drums. Uh, Biocow, did you just ask a question or is that from before? I just was not looking at the screen. No worries. Oh, man. I thought I would make it back before the end of the song. You failed, Brian. Uh, you completely failed. You get, you get, get, you get nothing. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> Whatever, as long as we're showing off weird stuff. Um, this is, it's it's really fun to build a meme within your family. Um, it's like you're an audience, you know? It's just... I mean, and, and wait, what are they going to do, run away, you know? So... Uh, no, sometimes. <laughs> there, there was this, uh, we watched a... Uh, uh, Willy Wonka, and uh, somebody took a Which version, the new one or the old one? Or? Old one, the 1970s. And uh, somebody had, <laughs> let me set this up. So somebody had taken some copyright free music and then cut the end scene to make a song. And now my 11 year old just can't stop singing it. The whole family has it stuck in their head. Uh, Are, are we having the thing where you can't hear it? Yeah, I can't hear it. No. Ah, bummer. Uh, uh, yeah, anyway, it's it's good. Uh, it's tasty. <laughs> but it's just uh, chops from that scene to some yeah. copyright free, free music. Uh, but uh, so uh, my kids. He has like Gene Wilder and I'd say like, what I like about like like I'd say that like one of the things that Will Ferrell had is that conviction, just a clear conviction to the character. And Gene Wilder especially is like, I don't think I'm watching a guy playing a character. I just feel like I'm watching kind of an angry, crazy guy. Yeah. Uh, okay. All right. So let's do this. We'll just start with us, and I'll count you in, and we'll do after talk. Uh, after things, sorry. Should stop naming all the shows the same thing. Three, two. Hello and welcome to After Things. I am joined by Brian Brushwood. Hello. And you, so, you know, mainly I'm here because I'm not so easily distractible. Like I don't want to just run off to South Carolina to see what's going on. Why would you go to South Carolina to see what's going on? There's <laughs> nothing going on there. Like, yeah, 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 it's yeah, nothing. That's what I what say. Is the, there is no outcome in South Carolina that's going to affect anything. <laughs> Certainly no surprising outcomes. <laughs> yeah, there's nothing There's nothing going to happen there that we're going to be like, well, that's shocking. Like, I'm so glad I went to South Carolina to, you know. Yeah. Uh, 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 so, so, uh, what do you want to talk about in in uh, after things? This is, of course, the segment. I'm, I'm going to be throwing an eclipse party on the day of eclipse in San Francisco, where you won't see it. There's <laughs> nothing happening because that's the thing people do now. So, uh, uh, speaking of which, uh, uh, do you want to come on out and see the eclipse? It's uh, going to be a heck of a party. We'll see. We'll see. We'll see. We'll I, I see. think I reserved my tickets, but yeah. yeah we'll see. We'll see. We'll see. All right. Uh, yeah. No. That's a. Uh, uh, at this point, uh, I guess we're doing eclipse report with Brian. So, um, uh, uh, five years ago, I called my shot. We started doing yearly as long as we could. Uh, curse you, COVID. Uh, 
uh, Founders Day picnics, and we've had a lot of fun adventures. We've had music, we've had comedy, we've had games and tournaments and giant trophies. It's been really, really good, but it has also all been leading up to kind of this April 8th. And um, for those of you who are so inclined, uh, uh, you could buy a ticket to the event at uh, scamstuff.com and, and just look for Founders Day. Uh, you'll see it. Uh, but um, the I spent a lot of time worrying about too many people are going to want to show up. But what I'm discovering as we get closer is, you know, a lot of people have figured out that you can see the eclipse at a lot of different places. <laughs> and uh, for, for me, emotionally, it's like, uh, 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 yes, you can drive and, and look at the moon eating the sun, and it will be delightful. But uh, to me, I'm so obsessed with the narrative of the entire thing, of it being this wonderful uh, band of miscreants and, and wild characters that we've known for, as you pointed out, 15, 16 years now, and actually being in the same place at the same time, uh, it was either you or Justin that said, you do realize that religions have been founded on less, and uh, it's, it's all coming together. Right now, we're, we're, uh, uh, total capacity is about 350, uh, and, and we're about uh, just shy of 200 tickets. Um, uh, if, if, if you're hearing this and you're on the fence, uh, I strongly encourage you to come on down and enjoy the eclipse because while we'll only have like two minutes of totality compared to the three minutes that Fredericksburg will have, we'll also have uh, bathroom facilities and you'll be surrounded by people who already love you. Um, it's It's been kind of an interesting journey, Andrew, to acknowledge what a community that you and I have been privileged to to craft and and be part of and and to I, be genuine with. I can tell you that the last eclipse, and I went to go see I, I the, the last time there's a total eclipse was coming up. I was sitting in Burbank in my apartment, and I see that this is coming up, and I'm like, you know what? I want to go see this. Like I had not thing going on for the next few days. I'm like, I think I want to go see this. And I try to think of all my friends, like who might want to go. And I go text Rudy Kobe, and he was living in Vegas at the time. I'm like, hey, Rudy, do you do you want to go see this? And like, I'll pick you up in Vegas. And Rudy's like, yeah, sure. So got in my car, drove to Vegas, grabbed Rudy, and we headed on up and had a great time hanging at Rudy Kobe, the coolest magician on the earth. Uh, you know, just crazy time. We found ourselves in the middle of um uh went all the way up to idaho and where you know one of the totalitarians and we, we go to this little we go we get into the area where we know it's going to be passing over and we see like this gas station this lot and they're like ah oh, park here for 20 bucks we're like oh i guess we could do that but i look up on a hill big hill and i see a water tower and i'm like let's go there i don't know what's there but there's a there there let's go there so we just get in, we drive up there, we get up there, and we find it's like Brigham Young University or whatever is there, and we find that there's free parking. So we park, and there's people hanging out in the parking lot. We're waiting and waiting. And I'm like, you want to walk around? I'm like, yeah. So we start walking around. We go up a hill. Next thing you know, walking through a neighborhood. And by the way, Rudy Kobe is wearing his lab man outfit, you know, so he looks like he just landed from a spaceship. And we're walking through this nice neighborhood. And people are like, hey, how are you doing? What's going on? I'm like, we're from L.A., <laughs> you know, and uh, uh, we could tell. And then we, we we get to this neighborhood. We get there. And then I look out there and I see looks like a field. I'm like, huh. So I make a left and we keep walking. Next thing you know, we are at this area. We're at the base of the top of the hill. And it's just like wheat field, whatever it is, crop growing on and on and forever. And we find this spot where there's an RV and these other people gathered there in the middle of the field. And you can see clear into the valley from here. It was, a, we look around like, this is like the perfect view. And so we decided to watch there. Met these people, really nice. There's dog running around. And, and Rudy's like, 
this is like close encounters. I'm like, yeah, this is very much like we heard there's this thing and we're there and talking and all of a sudden the thing with an eclipse is it's hard. There is partial and a total. A total eclipse is a very different experience than a partial. A total eclipse, there is the, it is a dark ring in the sky that you can just look up at because the sun is blocked out. Well, and and, and, and you, it, it, it should be said that even a partial eclipse is a wonderful dreamlike wild experience. Um, but as you and I both know, does not hold a candle. Oh, <laughs> I've been so many partials, and that's why I almost didn't go. I'm like, well, I've seen a partial. I didn't know the difference. Yeah. And the difference is you just look up, no, no filter, whatever, and you look up and you see this you see the black hole in the sky where the sun was, and these weird tendrils of energy, you know, the 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 solar rays coming out. The thing that happened too was everything got and that happens to impartial. Everything gets quiet because wildlife and animals are like, is it dark out? I'm like, okay. And the frogs are like, time to go to sleep, you know? And it just got super calm. And we could watch the shadow, just the darkness sort of pass over us and go across the valley. And, and I've said there's, you know, the only one other experience that I compare that to is when I was with great white sharks and I'm down in the bottom of the Pacific Ocean Isle of Jaw, surrounded by great whites, and it's just this incredibly weird thing where you're watching nature and it's full force before you, and you're just small. On it. it felt like that. By the way, my Shark Week special, Enderman Ghost Diver, is available on Max right now if you're a Max subscriber. Nice. So anyhow, um, that was yeah. So I I I and to be able to see that, I had a great experience because I'm there with my buddy. What would it be like to be there with 350 close friends? Well, show up and find out. Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping it lands the way I want it to. Um, I, I, I've, I've been slowly tipping parts of it. One of the bits is that um, uh, uh, famous comedian and skeptic George Harab performs a like 34 or 26 minute version of the entirety of Dark Side of the Moon. And uh, I, I, I remember at two o'clock in the morning, at uh, Dragon Con, watching him perform. Yeah, let me let me see if I can find it. I, I forgive me if I've already shown this. Uh, George, um, um, uh, number one, if you're younger than than uh, uh, I don't know, thirty, you probably don't know the mythical status that that. Uh, uh, Dark Side of the Moon has uh, for I the rest make of the any world. Any such assumptions of what somebody under thirty now knows, Brian? Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, like, like you and I in our lifetime, Dark Side of the Moon is one of the most best-selling albums of all time, uh, and has world records for it, right? So, um, the uh, during this time, George Robb just sits down and just performs the entirety of it. Uh, it's wonderful because it, it takes you through various soundscapes and it talks about such simple themes that are timeless you know aging uh, there's a track called time there's a track called breathe run rabbit run you know and then there's us and them which is if you pay attention to the lyrics is about the cold war uh face off between the ussr and the usa um but then Near the end, it becomes introspective, and there's a track called Brain Damage uh, talking about a band member who uh, was institutionalized, and they're like, uh, when the, well, here, I mean, take a listen. On the dark side of the moon. So, so at this point, you know, it's, uh, uh, and, and by the way, Andrew, the uh, folks at home Live will, hear yes, will so definitely hear it. Yeah. Uh, but the, um, uh, but you know, it's, uh, 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 you, you take the blade, you rearrange my brain, you fix me till I'm sane, that kind of thing. But then at the very end is this incredible crescendo with the final track called Eclipse. 
where it's, you know, and all that you blank and all that you blank and all that you blank and all that you blank. Um, so the plan is, as special as this performance from George was, wouldn't it be neat if he could perform it and to the very second end uh, the eclipse track as the actual eclipse happens. And so um, I don't think there's a way for me to do this without you hearing echoes. Uh, Andrew, so don't worry about me. I mean, if people okay. are hearing it okay. on the, okay. yeah, the, yeah, yeah, the recording, yeah, yeah. that's fine. So, so, so just, just, just trust me. But, 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 but this imagine the sun is getting darker and darker and darker, and it actually goes total eclipse when you hear this over the top moment. The idea, of course, being like uh, uh, whether it's slightly cloudy or whatnot or who cares, it's going to be a transcendent, bonding, incredible experience for everybody who who, who comes. And uh, uh, I, I, I hope you guys will show up. Just go to foundersdayeclipse.com. Uh, it's it's. Uh, one thing I didn't realize is that a lot of people have figured out that you can see the eclipse anywhere and maybe without having to go to a giant picnic. But in the meantime, it's, it's, it's about the friends you meet along the way. Well, I would, I, I think that absolutely. I mean, it's like where, who you go there with, whatever, like if I had seen, you know, the eclipse last time by myself, it wouldn't have been the same experience of, you know, to take people, you know, do a road trip, you know, hop in a car with some friends and whatever, and then show up at this place where, you know, you're going to find a lot of like minds. I think it's just a great way to do it, you know? So, um, I, right, yeah, we, we'll see. We're trying to do it. Uh, I made a reservation for a hotel. Then they decided to move me much further away from where I was originally going to be. I picked the hotel very carefully. And then I got, oh, we've changed your reservation to the one in like the city. And it's like, oh, thanks for that, guys. Uh, 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 talk talk to me about that. I, I, I might have options. Well, we'll see. We'll see. We'll see. Uh, but in the meantime, oh. April 8th, 2024, yes, it's a Monday. But no, nothing will get done in America that day. Uh, yeah. uh, tickets available at Scam Stuff or just go to foundersdayeclipse.com. Very cool. I think that's awesome that you're setting this thing up. Very, very cool. Um, and it sounds like you've, you've really planned out like some cool things to take place. Uh, yes. Uh, and, uh, and, and it's, it's been a little bit almost funny to, like see the rest of the world figure out like oh, do you know that traffic's gonna be the thing i'm like oh you don't say and it's like uh you know that porta potties might be in shortage i'm like mm, good thing i booked them six months ago uh <laughs> we, we we've been ahead of the game on this one <laughs> 
bathrooms you say interesting um very cool i think that uh i want to talk a bit now about how do you protect yourself from the ai future oh did we talked the pre previous episode and this is a, this segues into it too because like uh sora is amazing it ain't gonna replace her in eclipse right you know and, and, and a lot of we've talked about before there are going to be shifts taking place in the previous episode. We mentioned, you know, Tyler Perry's really concerned about what's going to be the impact of, you know, AI generated stuff. And Brian has pointed out that stuff where there's a human at the center of it still matters. And this is the argument I presented to people is you can hire Tom Hanks brother to do Tom Hanks voice. If you want to make an animated show, which maybe you do for the kids version of the, the direct video version of toy story. But when you do the theatrical toy story, you hire Tom Hanks. Why do you hire Tom Hanks? Because, because people know he's, who Tom Hanks is. Yeah. You know, and Tom Hanks is going to go hop on the couch for Jimmy Fallon and talk about it and be a person. And when you hear that voice, you're not just hearing Woody, you're, it's Tom Hanks, and everything comes with it. And that's not to say that you're not going to get a lot of CG voices used across stuff in video games. You will. But there's a reason people got excited when Keanu Reeves took the stage at the announcement of years ago for Cyberpunk. Because all of a sudden, cyberpunk became 27, became real, became more real because this person they know and love got paid large amounts of money now to be in this franchise. And that is going to mean things. And that means that everything will. I think a lot of children's entertainment is going to be completely AI generated because a seven year old kid doesn't care if a robot made it or you know, if Mr. Rogers is a real person or not. But as we get older and we develop identities and we understand personhood and whatnot, then these things will start to matter. And, you know, the example I give is like, why is reality TV a thing? And we could argue that it's kind of very scripted, but it's the idea exists that these people are real. Now, the events may not be, but the idea that there's some connection to that. Kim Kardashian is proof that the robots won't completely take over. That's my claim. And, you know, Christopher Nolan famously still uses film, tries to minimize the amount of CGI that he uses, still uses it, but it still kind of get, reduces it. You know, Christopher Nolan's going to be making things on film with real actors for a long time. Of course, because it's a cost factor, he'll be able to afford to. So, but what do you do if you're, you know, a gaffer? What do you do if you're a lighting person? What do you do if you're in that part of the industry? And, you know, I think very soon you're going to shoot with, you know, I was talking to a filmmaker about, you know, how the movie creator was using much smaller, you know, uh, 4K cameras to shoot the film. And the idea that production is shifting into these smaller cameras and stuff, you will be able to shoot a feature on your iPhone and it could be grainy and all. And I'm just going to go into an AI and I'm going to up the color and do this sort of stuff. So I do think positions like you know, a lot of positions, lighting gaffers, things like this, electricians and stuff, they are under threat. My suggestion is, you know, you think about getting skills in places that are going to be needed. One of the things that's been happening at, I think, uh, major NFL games, I believe it is now. Uh, Apple has been filming them in spatial 3D. And that's been happening more is that there are people now looking into like, okay, well, what's going to be a new medium? Well, capturing live events in 3D, capturing stuff in new formats. So I would say is like, what other areas are new that are going to need people and skills? And that's the thing to think about. Well, uh, uh, think about, uh, and, and this is me just coming up with this on the fly. So it's probably dumb and stupid, but like uh, I, I'm gonna bet that most people who are gaffers or 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 key grips or whatever aren't there because they love cables and love moving them. They, but they are there because they would love to be there for the entire process of the creation of things. And uh, let's say all of a sudden there are no uh, cables to gaff and there's no grips to key or whatever. Uh, there still will be a position. Or uh, I, I'm going to invent one right now. Um, hey, uh, for the over-the-shoulder experience, uh, can I be the, the guy? And like, what's that? Oh, it's basically I stand over the shoulder and I watch you create the process. And eventually you sell, after the movie becomes a giant hit, we sell a two-hour documentary of how you made the movie. Um, uh, so, so same, uh, that's something that, that we wouldn't think of, but it fills the same void of some, a person wants to be there to see the creation happen. And, 
they could do so in a way that that where where a gaffer was an expense, all of a sudden an over the shoulder Zoom guy becomes a a net benefit to to the value of the entire production. Yeah, I think there could be. I think there will be different opportunities we hadn't thought about. Like when DVDs came out, the idea that somebody had to make a DVD menu. You know, somebody had to think about the extras, the features, and caption behind the scenes stuff. A lot of that becomes a thing. I do think like the the number of roles, yeah, are going to shrink on sets. You know, that there there are going to be fewer people employed on sets as, and that's happened already. That's been shrunk a bit. Like, you know, LED lighting, like LED lighting, changed a lot of that, and and that it's hard to sort of equate it. Like, how much did that really change? But once you're able to use LED lighting and fewer lights, et cetera, that made a difference. You know, once you started getting these these cameras with higher dynamic ranges, you would hire your lighting designer to come in, but you might use slightly less lighting, which might have been or slightly less lighting rented from the rental house. And a lot of these things have been invisible. And we're getting stuff too now where audio is going to have a big change because, you know, you've used, uh, I assume you've used the Adobe audio tool for cleaning up voices. Yeah. The podcast tool. It's phenomenal. It is phenomenal. And you can take really, and it is only getting better. And it's going to get to the point where I just need to have something recording their voices on set. And I don't need to have super sophisticated sound gear or whatever. I just got to know that I, mostly that I have it. But if I don't have it, great. I can just stitch it in. That's going to be a big change. Well, and, uh, and on top of that, if there are uh, uh, people with a rich data set of past performances on everything ever, it's like, no, 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 I get it. I know how to replicate that voice. And yes, I can. I too can barely hear this conversation, but I can recreate it uh, as as though everybody was running, you know, with 100% fidelity. Yeah, and that's going to just keep changing and just it's going to keep moving forward. So I think for people like I said, if you're if you're if you're a person who's working on set in a technical capacity not directly it can be concerning, you know, are there are going to be as many, you know, grips and gaffers and stuff? I don't think so, but if you start to learn how to use other sorts of technologies, you know, how to, how to adapt, like, how am I going to shoot spatial video? How do I work on a set like that? And you'll be in demand. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, it, it reminds me a little bit of a tip for generating images in Dolly. And I assume, you know, the video uh, uh, stuff to come, like the best images I've gotten are ones where I'm able to specify the exact equipment, like uh, macro photography, 55 mil or 50 millimeter lens, uh, three inches away, uh, or, or a Polaroid 1977, this model camera or whatever. Like the mere knowing of those things is going to be a type of expertise that will be invaluable to, uh, like a director of cinematography actually has to position cameras and focus things and all that stuff. It could be in a future world that a director still directs. Eh, that's pretty much the same. But now a, 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 a director of cinematography, their job is just to know the look that is going for. And it's like, uh, uh, like, and they, you know, they close their eyes, they, they pinch their temples and they say, uh, focus with a high headroom reminiscent of, Mr. Robot, roughly keep golden ratios on high contrast areas. Um, we're aiming for 1967 Leica lenses, uh, no lens flares, background and foreground in focus. And and it's like that that is that is the same work that somebody would do, except for they don't have to do the work and then, but they get the exact result. I think that for people who are like in their, in their creative positions, I think they're going to, for the most part, there will be a good pathway like the DPs and stuff. Cause I do think that you, you want to bring in somebody because like a DP can work in digital, can work at stuff. There are people think about that with computer animated, but I think more, I just still think like that, you know, the, the the assistant dp you know the the assistant camera the acs and all that that's the thing that you think about are going to be impacted and that's why like if you're 
you know, uh, I talked to a guy who worked on, who was a camera guy, worked on like Pretty Little Liars, worked on shows like that, which was one of the first shows to be shot on, I think it was the red. And at the time he's, uh, you know, he's like, yeah, he's telling everybody, yeah, this is all going to be, everything's going to go digital. And back then they're like, ah, oh, no, we're going to film. And he was right. Everything went digital. And he was a guy that was learning and embracing digital. And as things became more digital, he's a guy that, you know, was able to continuously work in the industry because he understood where it went. And I think that for, if you were a person who's not, the creative on there, but you're doing a technical role, where is it going to go? Well, it is going to go towards more digital, more CG, more AI, but also we're going to be interested in spatial experiences. You know, if, if, if I was right now, you know, I would be learning how, Hey, how do I set up? How do I, how do I capture, you know, a baseball game in 3d? How do I do this? Who's doing that right now? What companies are doing this right now? Reach out to them. Hey, I want to work with you. Yeah. All right. I got, I got three weeks of catching up to do on posting now. All right. <laughs> Any picks? Uh, you know what? As, uh, as far as picks, um, l- uh, l- uh, it's been a minute since I've had something I'm like really stoked about. Uh, you know what? I, I, I'm going to do a self pick. Uh, uh, Tom Merritt and I have stumbled into something that we think is quite good. Uh, we used to, on our Cord Killers program, do uh, like, you know, we would commit to watching all of a series. Uh, the problem is some of the series were good. You know, they'd have their ups and downs or whatever. But it's like, wow, we did it. We finished The Shield. We finished The Wire. We finished Game of Thrones. We finished uh, whatever the Westworld, you know. Um, but lately, we want to go through more stuff faster and we stumbled upon the format of first, best, worst, last, which means every month we watch the first episode of a series, then we watch the highest rated episode of a series, then we watch the lowest rated episode of a series, then we watch the last episode of a series. And the first time we did our lap of it was uh, uh, about the West Wing, and it was great because it's like first episode, I'm like I understand why this is popular. And then, then it's like best episode. I'm like, I'm like oh, I, I, it seems like this is a really emotional episode. Worst episode was the most fascinating one because the worst episode of the West Wing was great. It just didn't happen to be about any of the main characters. And so that's why it got rated worst, not because anything was wrong. It was it was just an amazing episode. And then we watched the last episode, so we felt like we got the whole story. So we intend to keep on doing that. But I would love, uh, write me personally at brian at schwa.com if you have any suggestions for uh, entire series that we should do that first, best, worst, last experience on. Sounds cool. Uh, my pick is... Uh... Founders Day Eclipse Picnic. Um, what's the URL again? Uh, 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 FoundersDayEclipse.com. There you go. Everybody, it's been after. Nailed it. Do I have to change nothing? No. All right. Well, cool. Uh, uh, I'll tell you what. Uh, g- give me a few minutes to futz, futz around. Uh, you're going to be around for a bit if I have a question, right, Andrew? Yeah, want me to stay on stay on the call? Uh, uh, I don't think there'll be a need to. Um, okay. I think I, I I think I could do it. It's just like I'm I'm gonna have to dedicate the next ninety minutes to it, and I haven't had that opportunity until just now. All right, just let me know. Okay. All right, you got it. All right, so long, Here. people Bye. on the stream. Boo, 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 boo.